Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Mindset 101. Today we are going to be talking about a very powerful practice that you can add to your life called skepticism. Now, just to say for fun in the chat, how would you describe skepticism and is it valuable? Because I didn't learn about this as a concept until I was already in college. There wasn't a class on skepticism or anything in middle school or high school. It was specifically a cognitive science course or actually a section within the first cognitive science 101 course that I took where we were talking about the differences between how humans tend to trust each other just by their nature and by their intuition and how oftentimes people will be giving you bad information to manipulate you for their benefit in some way. And skepticism can be a practice where you basically defend against stuff like that. People are trying to use bad information against you for their own advantages. Maybe they're trying to sell you a product that doesn't work. Maybe they're trying to get you to buy into an ideology that gives them power and influence over you. Maybe it's a political kind of persuasion. Skepticism is the process of really thinking about what's being said to you and putting those ideas to the test asking about them, clarifying things, doing your own research and figuring out what is actually going on. A lot of people in the class are already saying that they're skeptical that this is gonna help. A lot of people are doubting if this is the correct stream title and I wanna applaud you on bringing the correct energy to the table of questioning everything. Good job, chat. Good job, chat. So just off the bat for fun, I wanted to share uh, a part of my life where I was scammed and I clicked on a bad link that was in my email because they duped me into thinking that there was a sponsorship when really it was a keylogger that was trying to get credentials from me. So here's how I fell for the scam. There's an email that is saying, hey, love your streams, love your YouTube and Twitch. Here is a razor company sponsorship and we're gonna give you mouse stuff you can sponsor uh, heckin mouse pads keyboards we have shirts and merch and stickers and stuff and we want you to promote this so I was like oh that's really cool like that's a pretty major company within the gaming scene people are gonna recognize that they do make some pretty good products so I was like this could be cool so I click on this link and it wasn't actually a like assets package for me, it was a keylogger thing. It was like a .exe. So that computer that I had had consistent problems after that point, but I still have my identity and everything. So I didn't get punished too hard, but I definitely clicked on a scammy link because I wasn't appropriately skeptical in checking myself before I wrecked myself. I should have checked their email address. I should have checked what type of file and link that I was clicking. I should have maybe done a second pass just to kind of think about the offer uh, more. But that was one example where I didn't quite filter out the scam effectively. Now there are all kinds of scams that go out. Many people are told that they have a whole bunch of money. In Africa, for example, there's the Nigerian Prince scam where they have a whole bunch of money and they want to share it with you. All these different kinds of scams where they're really trying to get you to invest in whatever they've got going on usually for their advantage. Let's look at credulity. Credulity is the natural bias, our tendency to believe others. And the reason we need credulity to survive in the world is because of urgency of combat in the wild. Say for example, this is pre-technology, this is pre-agriculture. You're in a hunter-gatherer tribe and someone in your tribe runs up to you and says, Oh my God, there's a saber tooth tiger over there. We need to run. Anyone who is like, hmm, was it really? Are you sure it wasn't a squirrel? All those people died. Anyone who doubted in that moment of crisis and was like, is there really? They got eaten by saber tooth tigers. So humans tend to be more likely to believe someone than to disbelieve, all things being equal. We have that natural leaning and it makes sense for us to have that. So we can't really be mad at ourselves for that tendency, but we do need to know 
that by default we are more likely to trust people than to distrust them. What are some other factors that can feed into this uh, notion of credulity? One of them is charisma. People who are really nice to listen to or they seem cool, they've got a nice style, they know how to make you feel good when they talk to you, we're more likely to trust them and to believe in them. So you need to be really careful about that. If someone is very good with their words, maybe they're very attractive, maybe they're very funny, they're very charismatic, that doesn't mean that what they're saying is true. So you need to make sure that even if someone is very nice to listen to, you're still putting their words to the test and you're still trying to understand more so what they're bringing to the table with you. Other types of ways you can be skeptical about your life and your environment. One of them would be when people are giving you advice. Let's say advice about self-care and diet. How many different diet plans are there? There are a lot. And you wouldn't really say that they're all equally good. There are gonna be some diets that are much better than others, but I'm sure you can think of examples of people who are really going super hard to bat for some particular kind of diet. Off the top of your head, is there anyone who's really tried to pitch one of these diets at you? I've heard some people saying that carnivore is a cool thing to try. I've also heard people that say that carnivore causes them to have really difficult uh, poops, which is not good. Freely is a diet that someone tried to pitch to you. What is a freely diet? What do you do with that one? You know someone who's trying to pitch keto drinks? Yeah, keto is interesting. I've never tried it myself. I've heard that it's not that good. But I didn't really dig enough into it to have a, a very broad understanding. Fruit only raw vegan is a freely only fruit you can have? Water is keto, so you approve. You can't even have vegetables? Hmm. Fruit is tasty. I feel like I could survive a fruit only diet because it's enjoyable. But I'm skeptical as to if that's optimal or not. It seems like it would be really hard to get high protein if you're lifting. Protein is really heavily concentrated in some veggies like peas and stuff. I will tell you one example where I practiced skepticism uh, whenever I was assessing whether I wanted to try veganism or not. I needed to look up and see what are the main vitamins and things that people can be deficient in if they go for a vegan diet and they don't have animal products. And basically you can kind of boil that down to what are the animal products that are really dense and stuff that your body needs. And that would be usually fish and eggs because they're really high in protein and omega-3 fatty acids and such. So just kind of getting those from sources and making sure I'm checking all the boxes. So I'm actually having a well-balanced diet. I have been able to gain some muscle over the past few months, which has been really awesome. So I am putting things to the test and not just blindly following a set of ideas and assuming it's gonna go well for me. You do need to test things as they go and pay attention to yourself. So that's a, a really key point here. If we can go to some notes here. For skepticism, we have trusting versus testing in the notes. Uh, we tend to be trusting on average especially of people who are within similar demographics as ourselves. We tend to trust people who have the same religion more than people who are from a different religion. We tend to trust people who are of our same country and language more so than people who are not, things like that. So the more in-group someone is, the more likely we are to trust them as well. And these are all kind of uh, almost like xenophobic uh, tendencies that we have where we tend to shun and be more sus of the out group than we are of the in group. It's a survival strategy, but it ends up causing us to be somewhat unfair when it comes to how we treat others. 
a lot of times people don't really have their mental defenses up whenever someone who's in a position of authority is talking with them. One example uh, that will be thrown around a lot, and I want to challenge you to pay attention to this, is whenever you see an expert talking about something, you should check to see if the topic that they're addressing is the same as what their degree is in, or at least similar. Because a lot of times people will trust someone who has a PhD, even though the topic that they're addressing in that moment is totally different from what they studied. So they're basically just a normal person when it comes to that topic. They're a lay person who might be pretty sharp. They may be mentally really quick and they can learn stuff fast. But if it's way outside their field, you should take their information with several grains of salt. I, I know Deepak Chopra is someone who has used that a lot whenever he debates people who are more sciencey and they challenge a lot of uh, what he pitches to people. He'll say, well, I have this degree. And that's kind of a fallback plan for him to still appear very credentialed and smart, even if he doesn't have logical legs to stand on. So be aware of argument from authority where people say, I must be correct because I have this degree or because I have this title in my job. Have I heard of a call-in advice show streamer called Toad PhD? I have not heard of that. What is it about? Random thought about skepticism. If you take a moment to think, what does this person stand to gain if I believe them, it can get you pretty far. That's a good question. That's a really good question. I'll even add that. Cool. What does this person stand to gain if I believe them? What's in it for them? What's in it for me? It's a guy hanging up on people. Oh, so it's not really that much advice. It's more hanging up. That's fair. Oh yeah, fruit only, raw vegan, they have no fat in their diet. Yeah, fats are really important. Really, really important. As we were getting started, Fuzzy Cord describes skepticism as a spam filter for your brain. It's very important to be able to sift from noise to signal and figure out which is a useful signal for your mind and what is effectively noise because a lot of stuff will just straight up waste your time. And you have to protect yourself and your time because you have limited time in life. So if someone is stopping you on the street to try to pitch something to you, if you know that you don't want that, then to listen to them would just be wasting two people's time. So there is a sense of just social efficiency here of realizing as a consumer, as a person, these are the things that I want to pursue. These are the things that I do not. So even if a person is very charismatic or they seem very excited about their ideas, it's not necessarily something that you're obligated to invest in. Someone in chat has religious cousins who weren't allowed to watch shows like The Little Mermaid. It's because they weren't taught how to determine fiction from fact. That's weird. Chat saying go with your gut, unless you're presented with a lot of credible evidence to the contrary. Yeah, trusting your own intuition is good. Another thing that's really cool too, is to be skeptical about the ideas that you already hold to be true, which a lot of people don't do. Once they've accepted an idea and they've internalized it, they don't put it to the test anymore. They assume that it's true forever and they don't really revisit it. That can cause people to be very set in their ways when those ways might not actually be good. They can hold on to negative traditions of hatred even, like racism or something. And they won't even reconsider the notion that, hey, what if we're wrong about inequality of people? What if people should actually be treated equally? If they could be skeptical, 
they could also challenge a lot of those pre-existing negative notions that they have. So skepticism isn't just about new information that you're getting in, it's also about existing information that you've held. Be thankful for the friends you have around you. Very true, smelly feet. Sorry for your loss. Hang in there, Siam. Yeah, so we mentioned the credulity bias earlier and how that's very much a default for us. Uh, credulity is kind of like gullibility, but it's not really coming from someone who is inherently unintelligent, which gullible, they more so equate to being foolish or just not smart. Uh, credulity would be you're just trusting of people and you don't really apply your critical thinking. And this is another important fact to lay in front of us. Just because someone is smart doesn't mean they can't be duped or scammed. Just because someone is smart doesn't mean they can't be duped or scammed. Because a lot of times, a person who is, quote, smart, isn't always applying that same critical thinking lens to stuff. You'll just trust and assume, just to save mental energy in certain places. To be actively testing ideas requires consistent work and evaluation and no one has infinite energy. So yeah, be, be diligent about testing your own preconceived notions as well. And sometimes you'll be holding on to an idea for sometimes years that is factually incorrect, but you haven't actually realized that until it comes up and someone argues with you and proves you wrong. So whenever you have an idea and you're holding that idea, if you enter a conversation and that idea is tested and it doesn't hold up under scrutiny and the other person's perspective seems more correct, then you might need to change your perspective. And that can be really intimidating for people because they think that that means that they weren't smart, but it doesn't. It doesn't mean that you're not smart to admit that you're wrong. To admit that you're wrong means that you know that there's more to the world than you realize, that you're prepared to drop a bad idea for a better idea. And that's big, you should be flexible. You should be able to say, okay, even though a college professor told me this, if I find out better information later on, I'm gonna update my view to the better information and not get stuck on the old idea just because I heard that first. A lot of people will basically just have slots in their mind for, okay, this is how you understand this thing and once they have that slot filled, they won't challenge it with a new idea. Say for example, uh, the people who uh, grow up within one religion and they aren't given other options along the way, they aren't really putting all religions uh, up for evaluation and for their kind of commitment. They're basically going with what they were offered first and they're not really testing that at all. Uh, maybe some people do. This isn't saying that no one who's religious does, but I feel like for a lot of people, it's the path of least resistance to just go with what you're taught and to stick with it and not to test it and evaluate it. <clears throat> Escane dub, be careful, that's uh, racist. You're assuming a demographic of people are scammers in general. That's stereotyping, and stereotyping is wrong. Do you turn to neuroscience or another discipline to balance your skepticism? How do you have a healthy skepticism versus constant contrarianism? I think being honest about what in your understanding is the best current model, but is still limited in certain ways. Let's give an example of the Big Bang. The Big Bang is something that I accept as being the best scientific explanation for the explosion of galaxies and planets and stars, but what actually was occurring at the moment in time when it occurred and before then is really tough for us to actually get a complete picture on. So I accept it as the best model, but I don't have a massive amount of faith in it in that I haven't really seen 
everything about it. I know there's lots of evidence for it in how space-time is laid out now, and you can make good predictions of what was happening then, but it is so far away that I would say I have to gauge how much of a stake I want to put in that for a given idea. But you can kind of get comfortable in understanding what your current best explanations for things are. Evolution by natural selection, for example, to me is the most robust explanation for why we have so many animal species alive today and why certain ones are not alive anymore because they went extinct and why we have all these um, diverse creatures and so on. To me, that makes sense more so than the religious narratives that I've heard. But I do realize that it's possible that there is another religious narrative, for example, that does present a really good explanation for how the world works, and it might actually be the truth. So you could say that in that sense, I'm more of an agnostic than I am an atheist, because I guess there could technically be a god of some kind or a goddess that can do some stuff. So I won't assert that there are no gods. I will say that maybe so far I haven't been convinced. <clears throat> But if really good evidence comes up, if Jesus comes back riding on a white horse from the clouds, hey, that's evidence. That's strong evidence. And I will say hello. Fuzzy Cord listened to a podcast about an incorrect idea about how children learn to read became hugely popular despite all evidence. Yeah. Another example of a longer-term scientific error is the self-esteem culture that we were raised on with the psychology of the 80s and the 90s. In the 80s and the 90s, it was very much the notion in psychology that stress is bad and affirmation is good. So you should avoid stress as much as possible, and you should tell people that they can do anything. And this caused some problems with millennials specifically in that we feel entitled to certain things because we were told that we're the best and we can be winners and we can have everything. And that in a sense pushes us away from the mindset of we need to work harder than the competition to succeed. We need to work harder to win. We can't just be gifted and talented and automatically win. We have to work hard. Psychology from that before would be like, don't do stuff that stresses you out, you're great. But you do need to have stress. Stress helps you basically identify what is important to focus on and prioritize. Won't leave Jesus on red, got it. It's true, if Jesus does come back and I'm sufficiently convinced, I'll absolutely be full on Christian for sure. For sure. I'm not gonna deny the obvious if it's in my face. I just have my doubts currently which is why I'm not practicing the faith, but I used to quite a bit. And I have love and respect for Christians as well. So even if you're still currently practicing Christian, I appreciate you. I hope you live a Christ-like life and so on. You would say that the self-esteem psychology led to a generation who chased praise rather than progress very outcome oriented rather than growth and process. Yes, makes us results oriented. I agree with that. What if it's aliens? It could be aliens. There are a lot of people who believe in aliens. Some say that they are among us, but not detected. Other people say that they are statistically definitely out there. They're just very far away from us. That's probably more my current perspective. But yeah, the universe is a massive place. So the likelihood of water and thus life are extremely high, pretty much 100%. Are there any cults that you've been um, asked to join or asked to learn about? I think the distinction of a cult is somewhat fuzzy whenever there are different groups that can organize and they can do different kinds of yoga amongst each other and they don't really have a church structure, but they're definitely practicing spiritual stuff together. 
So it's not the easiest call of what is a yoga class versus a cult versus a religion. You can have mixtures of these things. Scientology is very big here in LA. Lots of buildings and facilities and so on for that there. And that's a very recently created cult. And it was also openly created too by a sci-fi author. So it's just really funny like how out in the open that cult was made but still people get into it. Hmm. Chronologic humans have existed for some tens of thousands of years out of billions. Uh, I would say humans, at least in a similar form. From what I've seen, it's about 100 to 300,000 years ago, where you would say it was almost an anatomical modern human. But yes, we're still very young. That's the point you're making. The point is we're super young on the geological time scale. You suspect virtually no cults would self-identify as a cult. Well, then maybe we should make one that's open about it. For a mere $8,000, you can take our entry-level course and learn how to solve your problems. Yes, that's a really, really interesting point, and it makes you wonder, am I getting $8,000 of value from these books? And I think that would be a good point if you were going to seriously consider Scientology or a similar expensive cult. You could give yourself a cutoff point. You could say to yourself, I'm going to spend $8,000 on these books. And if I don't see results in six months, I'm not going to invest any further. That would be a way where you make a plan for how you're going to test the investment and you don't sink down the rabbit hole of them taking all your money and being unsure of whether it's working. You should really take a hard look at that because $8,000 is a lot of money. People don't just throw around eight grand. That's a chunk. It could be called a cabal. Could. You think I'm a genetic specimen and literally one in a million and that I have a duty to create a huge number of offspring. You think I am? Interesting. Newsflash, they don't stop asking for 8K. Well, they have a really cleverly organized structure, a spiritual structure where you can rank up with money. So the more powerful you are walking into Scientology, the faster you can rank up. Results what? Remind me what I was on about. <laughs> Another thing that's really interesting is uh, being skeptical of propaganda and persuasion where people are trying to get you to fight for a certain cause. Oh, what results? Well, whatever they're promising with this money. So when you buy these books, what are they promising that you'll gain? And you need to like be strict about assessing that for yourself. Is it peace of mind they're giving you? Is it motivation they're giving you? I don't know enough about Scientology to say, but different religions will tell you that you'll find enlightenment, spiritual fulfillment. Actually, I have a prop here, a fresh prop. One second. I got a free pamphlet. I have a book here, and this book is The Key of Immediate Enlightenment. The Immediate Enlightenment. Check it. This isn't the key to slowly attaining enlightenment or the key to walking the path of enlightenment to get there later on. This is the key of immediate enlightenment, which me, that's bold. That's a bold title off the bat. So let's just look at some of this with a little bit of skepticism. 
we see the chapters here. An introduction of this person. The mystery of the world beyond, another chapter. Why must people be vegetarian, another chapter. Initiation, the Quan Yi method. Introduction of our publications and our liaison of fellow practitioners over the world. I think this is translated from is it Vietnamese. Not sure. No, it's China. Taiwan, actually. Okay. So be prepared, chat, because I might immediately become enlightened at any moment. This book is called The Key to Immediate Enlightenment. And their leader person is called the Supreme Master Ching Hai. That's a very lofty title. To be the Supreme Master of something. Not even like a medium level master. They quoted saying, I do not belong to Buddhism or Catholicism. I belong to the truth and I preach the truth. You may call it Buddhism, Catholicism, Taoism, whatever you like. I welcome. So it's kind of an inclusive there are many ways of truth approach. By attaining inner peace, we will attain everything else. All the satisfaction, all the fulfillment of worldly and heavenly desires come from the kingdom of God. The inner realization that our eternal harmony, that our eternal wisdom, and our almighty power. If we do not get these, we never find satisfaction, no matter how much money or power, how high position we have. I would say I agree with that, that inner peace is something that transcends socioeconomic status and that you can be rich and depressed if you don't have peace of mind. That's true, that's pretty based. It's also not a super adventurous idea. It's not really different from what Christ and Buddha were teaching. They also said our teaching is whatever you have to do in this world, do it wholeheartedly, be responsible, and also meditate every day. You'll get more knowledge, more wisdom, more peace in order to serve yourself and serve the world. Do not forget that you have your own goodness inside of you. Do not forget that you have God dwelling within your body. Do not forget that you have Buddha within your heart. Yeah, that's just kind of a you got this. Jesus and God are with you and Buddha as well. This person was born in Vietnam. Her father was a naturopath. Hmm. Master Ching Hai was not a typical child. She was found reading philosophical literature when the other children were doing homework and playing. Oh. Her parents were Catholic and open to Buddhism. Her grandmother was a Buddhist. Okay, so it seems almost like a little bit of a Bruce Lee kind of a person where they're trying to bring together Christianity and Buddhism. Sort of how Bruce Lee brought together Eastern and Western fighting styles. To me, this seems... It's wholesome and cute, and I don't really see anything that's super unusual in terms of an idea. Hmm. There's a speech this person gave at the United Nations in 1992. Okay. This is interesting. Is this the Tao? This is just a random sample booklet that we got on Earth Day. We were out at an Earth Day march, and there were people at a table handing these out. And I've been reading this book for like three minutes, and I don't think I got um, enlightenment yet. But if chat notices that suddenly I seem enlightened, just let me know. Yeah. Here's a quote randomly from this speech. They say this kind of machine can put you into a relaxed mental attitude state. Relaxing state, then you would achieve the high level of IQ. That's supposed to give you high knowledge, high wisdom, and then you feel great. And this machine uses selected music, outer music, so you need earphones, and they put some electric currents that stimulate you, and you see some flashes, so you also need a blindfold. Wait, what the fuck? There's a machine that puts people in Samadhi. It's in America on sale. It's for $770. What 
What the? F <laughs> They're selling a product for seven hundred seventy dollars. I think they're saying that you can achieve this through meditation though, so they're not necessarily pushing it. They're not necessarily pushing the item. So yeah, I would say that my skeptical attitude makes me feel like this particular pamphlet is an interesting story of someone who somewhat ascended the upbringing that they were dealt and they lumped together more ideas than the main religion that they were offered first, which is a cool step. Do I feel motivated to follow this person's method for achieving enlightenment? Not exactly. I can respect it. Yeah, she quotes the Bible and Buddha. It's kind of those things. So if you like a Bible plus Buddha combo, this would definitely be up your alley. Hmm. What if this whole mindset episode is the soft start and Nero is slow playing us into his cult? <laughs> hey, there is such a thing as idea inoculation. Does anyone know what idea inoculation is? I'll let you answer quietly to yourselves and then I'll answer the question. Idea inoculation is when someone preps you against certain ideas and tells you that they are bad and stupid and you should fight against them without actually breaking down why those ideas are incorrect. So it's sort of like if you degrade the out group and you perceive them all as unintelligent and the ideas that they have are absurd and ridiculous then you don't even need to assess their ideas because someone told you they're already so absurd that you don't even need to think of them. You should be skeptical of this as well. If you're being inoculated against certain things, you should try to figure out, okay, why are they trying to defend against these ideas? Are they actually threatening? So yeah, be wary of your propaganda that's being served to you. And when people are trying to persuade you, think about why, think about what their benefit would be, and think about what your benefit would be if you agree to their pitch. There's a quote in the movie Revolver. He says, the longer you listen, the sweeter the pitch. That definitely has some truth to it in that the longer you listen to something, the more opportunities they have to convince you. There's someone in the chat who's saying, if you're reading this, then you're in a 20 year coma. We're trying this new technique and hopefully this message reaches you in your dream. You have to wake up. That's a good point. I can test that idea. I'm skeptical of that being true because I think I'm looking at my screen in my room in OBS and I think you're a chatter. But in the case that I'm asleep, this should wake me up. Nope, I just slapped my face. I'm still here. Cool. Good example of things to be skeptical of. Thank you for being here in the chat. You're in a coma. It's actually your with an apostrophe and then an RE. There you go. Aside from the obvious sales pitches, what are other telltale signs of a cult versus a religion? You could say that the cult is probably more, um, abusive and territorial of its members. To me, I think a religion is more broad based and also widespread, uh, level of acceptance to the point where you can practice this without being hunted with cults. Maybe they're the ones hunting you or maybe other people. 
dislike you because you're a follower of that. So I would say you're looking at the public perception of the belief system. You're also looking at the, I would say the historical testing of the belief system. So for religions, there are histories of people arguing against it, and you can listen to all those debates. You can read the arguments that people have made about theodicy and things like this. Whereas if it's a brand new idea, or it's an idea that's from the past 50 years, and they're offering spiritual enlightenment, you want to know like what literature is out there of people who have contested this in some way. What are the holes in their argumentation? What are the gaps in the services they're delivering? A cult demands more of your time, effort, and money. Hmm. You believe in science. Science is a process, though. It's not an overarching uh, set belief system. Science is an inherently changing belief system based on the new information that's coming in and our new methods for testing the world. So science is in flux. It is not a set thing, the same way that a holy book would be set. Because you don't really want to change the words too much unless you think that a certain translation makes it more correct to its initial meaning. Whereas with science, we've thrown out a lot of ideas historically. Cults are secretive, whereas religions are out in the open. Yeah, some religions keep some stuff not in the open, though, as well. Say, for example, the Catholic Church. Does something exist if there's nobody there to witness it? If so, does everything exist? That's kind of similar to the question of, are we living in a simulation, and can we disprove that? We can't really disprove that. But I don't really have strong evidence to believe that that's the case, so I don't have a reason to change my behavior as though I were in one. So you can entertain a lot of ideas. A lot of ideas that if it doesn't change your environment, there isn't really much of a need to believe in it. You could say that there are thousands of invisible dragons flying around in the sky all the time. I don't have a way of disproving this off the bat, but I'm not motivated to uh, try to look for them or try to detect them in some way because I don't really think there's strong enough evidence that they're actually there, even if someone says that. The burden of proof is on them, you can say. Some observe that science progresses one funeral at a time. Is that when someone who wouldn't let go of old ideas passes away? <laughs> and then you update to the most fresh stuff? All religions began as a cult. They evolved over time. They definitely were more radical, for sure. And they're contrarian. That's one of the things about Jesus. Uh, whenever Jesus was doing his pitch and everything in his time, that was very much against the status quo for Judaism. So what he was preaching was very different, very much against what they were going for. So you wouldn't really say that he was leading an established religion, he was leading a radical uh, offshoot of Judaism. The Catholic Church is an organized international criminal conspiracy. Well, the way you could uh, describe that is that they've had historically a massive amount of power in the control of the flow of information because the Catholic Church had a much more a higher rate of literacy over time so they controlled how the bible was interpreted and they also basically controlled the keys to heaven and how they talked with people standing for their sins and so on and confession and forgiveness and also yeah they've done a lot of very bad stuff and then covered it up because it would hurt their pr but then they find out later and then it ends up being worse for their pr than if they just scolded the person and disowned them from the church, basically. Yeah, it makes you wonder why they did it that way. The sweep it under the rug routine. That never went badly. <laughs> well, cool. This has been a fun talk on skepticism. I hope that you're all very skeptical of this class. Of the classes I've done so far, 
you should be the most unsure of it. What if I'm wrong about all of this? What if we should just trust the first word that anyone says every time and that that's better? Maybe that's the case. Maybe it's not. Maybe you should be skeptical and think twice about what people tell you. And also think twice about what you believe yourself to be true. Because not everyone has everything figured out. Well, actually, you could say no one has everything figured out. So be flexible. Be able to test your ideas. Do some research. And you should feel refreshed. You should feel refreshed whenever you get proven wrong. Because they saved you from being wrong for the rest of your life. That's really nice. Credulity is misspelled. Hang on. This can be fixed. You're right. There's an extra I. Saved by the chat. Oops. Beautiful. Saved before the class was over. Thank you. Chat. Stay skeptical. Don't get scammed. Don't get persuaded. Unless it's a really good deal. And we will see you on the next episode of Mindset 101 with... Nero and the chat. Part of the Positive Mindset Alliance. <laughs>